want to talk about the stage a little bit because you are intimately acquainted with it and it went through various uh, arrangements, yeah. as it were. And that's the second one, is it not? It's that 62, when we yeah. changed sex. It was, it, 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 the comedies worked very well on the original stage. That's the one on the tent. It, it, that's a, many, more, many more pillars, much more delicate, much more Greek in feeling. But what we turned it to was something more Roman. And how is it Greek in feeling? Well, just the delicacy of these, the delicacy of that was, it was like a Greek portico. And there's, a, we, there's an insert of the, um, of the early version. Yes. Well, you see, it had its limitations. You came down the straight of a side entrance, walked straight into a pillar. So you couldn't use that side entrance for any important exit or entrance. But uh, um, we, we, we widened that out. It was my, my feeling, the more I got to know the stage, was that the, the big thing, the crucible of the stage, was the clash in the middle by, from diagonal corners. That is the clash of the play, of the plays. It's always easy. And to have strong entrances either side that were immediately uh, opposite the vomitories, or whatever you call them, the tunnels, uh, was instant theater, instant clash. And did you learn that from Guthrie, or did you just... No, I learned that from doing. By watching. Yeah, by doing and, and working and because making it happen. And the, uh, the octagonal uh, stage gave you the opportunity to... Uh, the, the thing that's at the moment in the Patterson Theater is a long tongue. Without the, the octagonal, you can't make it work as successfully as that works or worked. Um, the other thing, which is perhaps more important than that design, was the philosophy of what kind of stage you want for Shakespeare. And I'm, I know there have been all kinds of things based on a, a questionable sketch written by a Dutchman, possibly drunk, I didn't know after he'd seen a performance at the Globe, of what the Globe was like, but it's all. We know nothing really about it, uh, except that it obviously had depth, that it had all kinds of resources, brilliant carpentry, all kinds of lifts and, and uh, uh, things like that. Uh, but it was not based on pictures, mm -hmm. uh, and nor was this. This is abstract. So when you come onto a stage like the original festival stage, there is no picture. If you want to change, we were quite purist when we started. If you wanted to change the lighting to night, don't do it if you can avoid it. I mean, make it happen by changing, putting a darker cloak on or having people walk about as if they're in the night. But the target is make-believe, sharing with an audience, actor and audience, absolutely on their own, making an experience together. That's pure theater. I mean, there's an example of it currently in the British theatre of a play called War Horse, in which the horses are manipulated, each horse by, I think, three people. And the horses are going through war, World, World War I, and they, they have responsibilities for different parts of the body, how the different parts of the body react to a certain challenge and how they react to death or whatever it may be. And actors, it has to be actors who do this because it has to be, the, have the imagination of an actor to share responsibility for someone who's operating the tail or the ears or the, mm. or the nostrils or one leg or I don't know. Uh, and all of us who saw it <coughs> were deeply, deeply moved by it in a way that you know, think, you think, oh, this is, this is absolute theater. And I insisted on taking all my grandchildren to see this because I want them to believe in that kind of theater. Stratford was about that, make-believe. Because when, of the three dimension, because of the thrust or because of the because, dimensions of the space? Why, is that, why does it make your imagination work more? Because there's just nothing to fight you. There's nothing to t distract from you. You aren't walking on marble with the color of your own face, which is a competition. You're walking against wood uh, that is uh, responsive in sound and helping you speak well. Uh, but aside from, even if Stratford hadn't been three-sided, the idea of make-believe, I want to make that point, is the ideal theatre. When Shakespeare, for example, sends uh, Grumio, a head of Petruchio, after he's got married, to the country house, right. and it's very, very cold. And he's, uh, he's obviously got to make a fire to get warmth in the house. 
Well, in the current production, uh, someone <laughs> a light comes through a grill and the heating is supplied, so don't bother. But if you have a comic actor, and it's his job to, anyone playing Grumio is meant to have that talent, you just need a, a few little props, like a, a thing to put the fire in, maybe a, a little gray flag, little thing to pull up and a little flame-colored flag. But to go through the whole process of lighting a fire, getting over the cough, coughing attack with the smoke, getting over the joy of, you know, when the flame comes, and then not only that, but also the fact that he's frozen, his body's got to thaw out, and the fact of letting that body thawing out, every part of it, and sharing this with an audience, with whatever a comic chooses to do with the business, and there's a, there's a fire, we're all hot and hot, and it's done. That's magic, that's make-believe. Uh, and why is it, do you think, we have this taste for literalism, that I want to see the flames, I want to see the wood, I want to see pretend smoke, I want to see... But you, you get, you're satisfied with the other way, you see them better, if you made them yourself with the, with the actor. And he's really shared that feeling. But if you just put a light on, you don't feel anything. But today it seems we, there's a distrust of the imagination in creative places. If well, you look at the movies, if you look at television... Well, I, I uh, think if you try and make the theatre into a movie house, forget it. I mean, you, we either make a theatre or you don't. And I, maybe I'm a purist in that respect, but uh, I have no idea what I should recommend, if asked, for Stratford's future. I, ha I can recommend what I was recommended, what I, was, I felt we, where we should go. But now, I wouldn't know. I mean, Des McEnough is an old, old friend of mine. I've known him. He's a very brilliant man. And uh, I don't know what his, his, his plan is. I know it'll be very energetic and, and daring. Uh, but, but his roots are in a culture that's very literal. I want to see the lion. Let's have a real lion. I want to see 800 people dancing. Let's have 800 people dancing. I want to see a helicopter. Let's bring a helicopter on stage. Well, I don't think Stratford would last. <laughs> I mean, how could you pay for it? I mean, yeah. and it, it is about the imagination. If you deny the imagination, uh, and I know you're right to say that people are discouraged from using that imagination by having it deadened by other things, but uh, you've got to make, you've got to work to get them to get that aroused. Because if if you can't get the imagination aroused, don't bother to try and do Shakespeare. Is it Desmond Healy who called the festival stage a magic platform or a magic table? Probably. I don't know. He's and it was a phrase that struck something in me. It's a magic table. It is. And on that table of the stage, magic occurs. The magic, if the magic that occurs there should, can't just be on its own. I think it's got to be a magic that's, well, obviously shared with the house. I think it comes out of the, well, the, the journeys that these people take in plays, like whether it's Romeo and Juliet or whether it's King Lear, they, in a sense, are like lives. I mean, Juliet it starts a little girl. By the end of the play, she's a woman, a grown woman, utterly without a friend left in the world, who's grown up and found out this experience. I mean, that's a, a life to go through. And to make that possible, you can't have literal things that say this is all happening within a week. I mean, it's, uh, Shakespeare's use of time is, is a... Uh, the greatest enemy that Shakespeare has, has in time in all his writing, but the, the Shakespearean time is elastic. You have to allow that to happen. Or what I'm talking about, these pe people going through having lives, uh, doesn't make sense. So an, an absence of literalness makes that sense of growth a possible reality. Um, Do you think the same magic can happen in a two-dimensional stage in a in a proscenium stage yes so what are the advantages then of being in three dimensions it's not only a, it's not only a proscenium frame but it's thrust so it has a third dimension that comes into the audience what does this it, it makes for truth i mean it's once after truth on a picture frame stage the actor pretends to be playing to the other actor but in fact is really playing to the house in this, you can't do that. You've got to play together. You've got to face each other, pr usually and almost helpfully, on the diagonal. I find it more muscular. This that's stage, right. to me, feels muscular. It, it's true. It was. It was more muscular. It made for more muscular staging. And that was a deliberate choice on the part of... The to make the tragedies and uh, 
you know, and the first time I used it with a comedy was with uh, Taming of the Shrew, and we, we had these side entrances. It was rather fun because you just made those steps into ramps and then ramps down into the tunnels, and you could have coaches going up and down. You know, the, you, these players would arrive in, in, in a coach at outside the pub, and that, and that uh, wasn't possible on the other stage. And who initiated this change? I did, I think. So you went to Tanya? Uh, no. And then, uh, yes, you know, cause I had, we were very good friends. We had, knew each other for you know over a period of years. And Desmond too. I have to say, Desmond was always part of this picture. Desmond Healy. I gave him his second job uh, in England, yeah, which was Hamlet, with Alan Bedell, in a sort of um, turned up threepenny bit stage, very much influenced by my new contact with Stratford. I was still learning about Stratford, Ontario, while I was. And I was experimenting at Stratford on Avon, England, with the uh, Stratford idea of a, an octagonal stage. Just tipped it up, and um, and the Stratford on Avon was a proscenium, was it not? The Memorial Theatre. Yes, yeah, terrible. It's been. It's, it's, it's never been a good theatre. It's always been ill, de Ill designed. It's being redesigned up to a point now. Right. And the the thing that came from this Stratford to that Stratford, which was the Swan, was a lovely place to. Play and lo lo lovely for, uh, for the same sort of three-sided experiences. And what, do you remember any discussions you had with Tanya about the changes? I mean, did she come up to you and say, "I'm having these thoughts," and Michael, "I'm having these thoughts about expanding the back"? Or I don't remember. I think that it was a general feeling that we wanted to get the side doors way out. It was the first thing, and to have them confronting the tunnels. Then confronting uh, the tunnels, meaning that's right, absolutely. That di all diagonal, emphasis diagonal. If you know, if you know anyone who uh, rehearses with me, they get sick of they get sick of the word because I keep using it. Get on our diagonal, get on diagonal, um, and then you know you're not masking it. You're not masking someone mm -hmm. because the diagonals would be in front of the door and the tunnel, either side. Uh, and what was the function of the roofs, the, the small roofs over the three doors? Uh, what did, didn't have any function, they were entirely pictorial. Would you direct a comedy on that stage different than a tragedy or history? Yeah, well, of course, because it would be a different mood. And so would that but, affect but the way you stage In fact, I think there's every comedy, to my mind, any worthwhile comedy, contains tragedy, and every tragedy contains comedy. The, the sort of bureaucratic breaking of them down into the, these names, I think, is a misleading thing. They're all about life, uh, which is everything. You know, everything's there. So I wouldn't, my at attempt to interpret would be as thorough as possible. But if the, the tone is one of prankishness or of uh, very high style, behavior, then you just go, go, go that way. The other thing that interests me about this stage is the symmetry of it. That, and I but don't know what it, it does. It was inter interesting. After this, and I think this is one of the most beautiful symmetrical stages in the world, the Stratford Festival stage, in that shape. Uh, when they went after Stratford as a team, Guthrie and Rosevich, to start the theater, the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, Everything was asymmetrical, just as a, as a reaction against that. And it's certainly, I, I was there for seven years myself later because uh, Guthrie again persuaded me to go and do something because uh, they, they were in trouble. I couldn't have made it worse. Uh, and it was, so it was a fairly easy job in a way to make it better, but it, I, I, a much easier stage to direct on. Much the easier. asymmetrical version? It didn't go round so far. The segment didn't go round. It was over 200 degrees. You know? The only way an actor on that stage can hold an entire audience f at one moment is to lie flat on their backs and just to make, move your head a little bit. And you can get your eyes available to every seat. Right. But there aren't frequent occasions in a play when you can lie on your back and do that.